Sometimes in the Bible, tens of thousands of people die because a king is selfish and God has inexplicable whims. In fact, there are plenty of tragic biblical stories that don't get a ton of attention. The fall of Jericho to the Israelites is a fairly well-known story, specifically the part where the walls come tumbling down. But much less well-known is what happens immediately afterwards, probably because it isn't exactly family-friendly. As the text puts it rather explicitly, they devoted the city to the Lord and destroyed with the sword every living thing in it, men and women, young and old, cattle, sheep, and donkeys. And three verses after that, we learn that they stole all the gold and silver from the city and then burned it to the ground. Only a woman named Rahab and her family were allowed to live, as she had helped two men spy for the Israelites. But the death didn't end there. Joshua put a curse on anyone who rebuilt Jericho that would make their eldest and youngest sons die. In the first book of Kings, this is indeed what happens to a man named Heel, who loses two of his sons when he rebuilds the walls of the city. Miriam the prophetess was the older sister of Moses. When the Pharaoh ordered all young boys to be killed in the book of Exodus, it was Miriam who kept watch over her brother after she and their mother laid him in the Nile River. Once he was found by the Pharaoh's daughter, Miriam arranged it so that he could live with his birth family for a while longer. Follow it, Miriam. Watch it from the reeds. See where the Lord will lead him. Yes, Mother. Despite saving her brother's life, Miriam was punished severely for disagreeing with Moses years later. While the Israelites were wandering in the desert for decades before arriving in the Promised Land, Miriam and her older brother Aaron began to criticize Moses. This was possibly because they were jealous of Moses' position as leader, or because they didn't approve of his wife being from a different tribe. Whatever the reason, God wasn't happy, and Miriam was struck with leprosy. Aaron, however, did not also become leprous, although no clear reason is provided for this. Moses prays to God, asking for Miriam to be healed, and God agrees, but demands that she be exiled for a week first. Wandering in the desert for 40 years would surely fray anyone's nerves. The Book of Numbers covers a complex power struggle between Moses and the Levites, one of the 12 tribes of Israel, who resented not having more authority and who wanted to go back to Egypt. The leader of the rebellion was Korah, who assembled 250 men to join his mutiny. Moses then arranged the test to see who God liked more, and the two groups faced off by offering lots of incense. God made it clear he thought Moses was the most holy. After ordering others to stand back, Korah, two other rebel leaders, and their families were killed in dramatic fashion as the ground split apart and they were swallowed whole by the earth. Then, for good measure, God smote the 250 other men who had turned against Moses by burning them in a fire. After Moses led his people out of slavery in Egypt, they spent 40 years wandering in the desert, during which time the Israelites kept disobeying what Moses told them that God wanted. How can I lead this people out of bondage? This angers God so much that he lays down a cruel punishment, but only upon Moses. Long before Moses' death, he recounted a conversation he had with God, explaining to the Israelites that it was their fault that he would never make it to the Promised Land. As he declared to them, The Lord was angry with me because of you and would not listen to me. Moses' death is recorded in Deuteronomy, with God telling him to go up on a mountain and look out over the Promised Land that he spent much of his 120 years trying to get his people to. After Moses died, Joshua became the leader of the Israelites. A problem with disobedience, however, continued. After the Israelites defeated Jericho, they also tried to take the city of Ai, initially failing and losing 36 of their men in the process. This didn't make sense to Joshua until he found out that one of his people, a man named Achan, had disobeyed God when they sacked Jericho and kept some bounty for himself rather than giving it to the temple. When Achan was confronted about this, he admitted to taking a robe, 200 shekels of silver, and a gold bar that weighed 50 shekels. Since his disobedience led to the death of dozens of others, the punishment was harsh. Joshua and the rest of Israel took back the stolen items, and they also rounded up Achan and his family, as well as his cattle, donkeys, and sheep. They then took them to a place called the Valley of Achor, where they were all stoned and burned. While it's not spelled out exactly, many scholars believe that the text implies that not only was Achan stoned for his theft, but so were his whole family and even his livestock. The 20th chapter of the first book of Kings chronicles various battles, but it's also revealed that there are lots of prophets around during this time. According to verse 35, By the word of the Lord, one of the company of the prophets said to his companion, Strike me with your weapon, but he refused. Reacting normally to this weird request turned out to be a big mistake by the companion, as the next verse reveals, So the prophet said, Because you have not obeyed the Lord, as soon as you leave me, a lion will kill you. And after the man went away, a lion found him and killed him. 
When the first prophet asks the third prophet to hit him, this time he does so, hard enough to draw blood. The first prophet then uses this wound to teach a lesson to a passing king. Interestingly enough, this isn't the only time a prophet is killed by a lion in this book. In chapter 13, a prophet unknowingly disobeys God when a man lies to him. As verse 24 vividly describes it, As he went on his way, a lion met him on the road and killed him, and his body was left lying on the road, with both the donkey and the lion standing beside it. The ten plagues of Egypt that God brought down upon the kingdom when the Pharaoh didn't listen to Moses is surely one of the most famous biblical stories. Go ahead, make my day. But those aren't the only biblical plagues. An incredibly deadly example occurs after King David angers God, although even biblical scholars are a bit perplexed by the logic behind it. According to the text of the first book of Chronicles, Satan rose up against Israel and incited David to take a census of Israel. God becomes very angry about this census, although there's not really any explanation why. It's even more confusing when you consider that in the second book of Samuel, it is said that God made David take the census in the first place. Whatever the reason for God's anger, he sent an intermediary to give David a choice of what punishment he would receive. His options included three years of famine, three months of being swept away before his enemies, or three days of plague across Israel. Essentially, David was given a choice between suffering personally or letting his people suffer, and he chose the latter. The resulting plague is said to have killed 70,000 people in three days, with God only stopping it once it reached Jerusalem. In the second book of Kings, King Ahaziah injures himself and wants to ask God if he'll recover. But instead of turning to the God of the Israelites, he sends some people to ask the pagan god Baalzebub. The prophet Elijah stops these men and sends them back to the king, who isn't happy with the situation. So he sends a military captain along with 50 men to confront the prophet, which doesn't exactly go well. As verses 9 and 10 recount, the captain went up to Elijah, who was sitting on the top of a hill, and said to him, Man of God, the king says, come down. Elijah answered the captain, If I am a man of God, may fire come down from heaven and consume you and your 50 men. Then fire fell from heaven and consumed the captain and his men. For some reason, the king isn't discouraged by this disaster as he decides to send another captain with another 50 men. But then pretty much the exact same thing happens as the new captain demands Elijah come down with them. Elijah refuses and God burns them all up. And still, even after that, the king sends a third group of 50 men to the prophet. While the king may not have learned anything at this point, the final captain had. So he approached the situation very differently, throwing himself down before Elijah and begging for mercy. So Elijah finally agrees to get up and go with them to see the king. There's no doubt that Jezebel is one of the most famous women in the Old Testament. Her name has gone down in history as a personification of evil, but her story can also be read very differently. Her kingdom had been conquered by Israel after she tried to force them to worship Baal. When the king Jehu and his army entered the city of Jezreel, Jezebel dressed up according to her regal status and taunted him from her window. Jehu didn't react very well to this. He yelled at the men in the room to throw her down. So they did as they were commanded, and then Jezebel was trampled by horses. Jezebel, she is still the daughter of the king. But since Jezebel was a royal, Jehu began to have second thoughts, at least in terms of leaving her body out in the open. So he gave an order for her body to be retrieved and buried respectfully. That's when it became clear that being thrown from a window and trampled was just the beginning of the indignity that Jezebel would suffer for the crime of being upset that her people lost the fight. According to the second book of Kings, when they went out to bury her, they found nothing except her skull, her feet, and her hands. When Jehu found out, he declared that this event fulfilled a divine prophecy of her flesh being eaten by stray dogs. Jesus was crucified by the Romans, and soon after his death, his followers started being killed as well. The first one to die for these new Christian beliefs was a man named Stephen. While attempting to preach, he gave a long sermon that accused the Jewish people of terrible deeds throughout history. This didn't exactly make his listeners very happy, so they took matters into their own vengeful hands. According to the seventh chapter of the Acts of the Apostles, when the members of the Sanhedrin heard this, they were furious and gnashed their teeth at him. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked up to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears, and yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city, and began to stone him. What makes this case of martyrdom even more tragic and somewhat ironic is that a man named Saul was there at the time, although it's implied he egged on the killing rather than throwing stones himself. After persecuting many more Christians, Saul converted and changed his name to Paul. He then wrote many of the letters that became books of the New Testament, and he was made a saint.